As you know, the new year just started. Mainly, it's really today was the first official day of the year after Rosh Hashanah. I gave a few lectures before Rosh Hashanah, preparation for Rosh Hashanah, recommendation, what needs to be done, how to enter the trial. It's too late a little bit for that now because it's happened already, but now we have time to appeal in case we got a sentence that we are not happy with. We don't know yet. We will know next Rosh Hashanah what we were sentenced for. But since we don't know, we have to assume the worst. We can't take chances. Because we have to assume the worst, now we have a week to correct some of the decisions that Hashem made for each one of us. We'll be able, we will be able to reverse it in these seven days that are coming. The Arizal, one of the greatest Mekubalim in history, he said that between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there's exactly seven days. You have two days Rosh Hashanah all over the world, even in Israel, and then Yom Kippur. So Aseret Yemet Shuvah, three of them, is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So you have seven days in between. What's the significance of those seven days? Each day, like today, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, until Yom Kippur comes, each day it's a chance to correct all the days of the year. For instance, if today was Monday, if a person made a great Monday, great Shuva with Torah, with Tzedakah, with Tehillim, uh, he, he improved the way he behaved in his business with his customers, he's more honest, he became a better husband today, better father, many things to improve. All the Mondays of the year are corrected. Tomorrow is Tuesday. Tomorrow you can correct all the Tuesdays of the year. That's why Hashem gave us seven days in between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. One day for the entire 52 Mondays of the year, 53, 52 Tuesdays of the year. And this is how it goes. So one day we lost already. But today, since we fasted, we have the advantage. When you fast, that's already a part of, a main part of tshuva is to fast. Even though in this generation we're not so strong, it's better to sit and learn Torah or sit and, and read Tehillim than to fast. Because when a person fasts, what happened to him? A few days is okay, and then around one or two is starting to have headache or is hungry, he cannot function, he cannot learn. If a person missed one minute learning Torah, he didn't pay to fast. One minute. It would be better to learn one more extra minute Torah that's already count more than the entire day of fast. People think, oh, I fast all day, I fast all week. Yeah, very impressive. But Torah is a billion times more important than anything. There are two things that a clever Jew should put all his efforts in. What are the two things? If a person has X amount of energy to put into religion, what's the, f the top two things that he should put all his energy in, which will bring him the better earnings, the greatest reward? Torah and Zikui Arabim, helping the public to come closer to Hashem. How? Arranging lectures, making phone calls, making flyers, sending emails, uh, allowing speakers to come speak in a house, open the house for the public to come learn Torah, donate money to, uh, for DVDs, for CDs to give out to non-religious Jews. If you have uh, the possibility to design website and put the Vrai Torah, which people anywhere on the internet, we might as well direct them to the right place not to the garbage places when they spend most of their life there and destroy their soul. If they're there already, you might as well pull them to the right positive place. So, just a few days before Yom Kippur, I have the impression that many Jews 
not, don't know exactly how to do tshuva. Just to say to Hashem, okay, Hashem, from now on I will be religious, or oh, I'm going to start keeping Shabbat, or oh, I'm going to start giving more tzedakah, it's very nice. It's a, it's a nice step forward. But that's far away, very far away from the requirements of Hashem. Hashem gave us Torah, and the Torah he told us exactly what to do. The problem that we have is that we don't use the Torah, we use our heart to think. We go by our feelings. Most Jews, I know, I mean, I've been speaking to many, many people for many years. Most Jews do not use 1% of their head when it comes to religion. It's 99% the heart. Whatever they feel inside the heart, that's what they do. I'll give you an example. If you see a Jew that he has now to drive to do a very important mitzvah, let's say he, he has a shiur to give. He's teaching a group of people for one hour. And he has to get there, let's say 8 o'clock. Everyone will wait for him from 8 to 9. He's teaching one hour Torah to 20 people. And then he saw an old man walking in the street and come to him and say, you know, my daughter live here and I don't remember how to get to their home. Here, I have the address. Would you take me there? Help me out, please. I'm tired. What 99 out of 100 Jews would do right away? Take the old man to his daughter, no? Ma, you're going to leave him here? What does Hashem interested that you do? Go to the shiur, it's more important. What's going to happen with the old man? Don't worry, Hashem has plenty of people to help him. You're not the only person on earth. If you help him, you made one mitzvah. How many mitzvot you lost to earn that mitzvah? A million. Why? One hour Torah, each minute, a person say 200 words. Each word, approximately five letters. So each minute, 200 times five, it's a thousand letters. Each minute that the speaker speak, well, how long, how many mitzvot is that? Five times 200 per minute, a thousand mitzvot a minute. In that hour that he was teaching, 60,000 mitzvot. But that's if there was only one person in a crowd. If there were 30, 2 million mitzvot right there, 1.8 million mitzvot. For one hour teaching Torah to 30 people. Here there is more Baruch Hashem. So it's already, for me, already probably 5 million mitzvot in the next hour. For each one of you, 1,000 mitzvot a minute. Don't be greedy, it's also good. 1,000 a minute. People who don't come to learn Torah and they keep mitzvot, all their life they don't do enough mitzvot like a person who learns Torah does in one day. Two religious people, they both have yamaka. They both sit together in Shabbat in a shul. One in one day makes what this person didn't make in 60 years. Why? Torah. Hashem said, Nimut Torah keneget kulam. The learning of my Torah, it's like everything else together. The learning of the Torah, it's like everything else together. Bet HaMikdash HaRishon, the first Bet HaMikdash. The prophet, Yirmiya, saw the Bet HaMikdash is burning. It burned until the next day, 10th of Av, afternoon, ashes was coming out. The prophet Yirmiya came and asked the people, Alma Avda Haaretz. There were many, many chachamim, many rabbis at that time. Many, plenty of rabbis. Believe me, if you take one rabbi from that generation and put him together here around one of the blocks here, in less than a minute, all the shuls around here on Borough Park will be empty out. All of them will come to his shul. They'll have to invite the fire department. Why? When they see what a real chacham is, <laughs> they won't believe. What knowledge the Chachamim had at that time, 2,500 years ago. This is before the Gemara was written. We are so impressed by the Gemara, by the Tanaim, by the Amoraim, Mechayim Etim. Each one of them that his name is mentioned in the Gemara, he knew all the Kabbalah, he was able to take a dead body and put back the soul into it. Almost like a god. Such power they have. And this was only 1,700, 1,800 years ago. 
at 800 years before, wow, 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 the level of the Chachamim. So come the prophet, and he said, why Hashem was so upset that he had to destroy Bet HaMikdash? Why? What happened? What did we do? Everybody was thinking, why, why, why? Then he told them the answer. What was the answer? Al ozvam et torati. They did not respect enough my Torah. It was, they took it for granted. They got used to it. Instead of dancing on the street, wow, I have Torah in my hands. I, I'm able to learn Torah every minute. I'm free to do whatever I want. They didn't have time for it. The television is more important. But remember, they didn't have television in those days. There's nothing to do, really. So the people were learning Torah, because there was nothing else entertaining. What, did they, what, what else can they do? Sit in the park and play Sheshbesh? What can they do, the Chachamim, besides Torah? Since there was a clean generation, the ladies were modest. People did not have chutzpah like today. Life was very simple. They didn't know what crystal chandeliers are, or marble imported from Italy, or car, $150,000. Extra 10,000, Rabbi, just that I'll be able to see sunlight. <laughs> Tell them, come, make 10,000 DVDs, we'll save about 5,000 Jews, we'll make them religious. $10,000. Come, no help. Rabbi, business is very bad. A week later, how, how, how much is this Lexis? 80,000. And this, 90. What's the difference? Sunroof. Okay, let's go for it. Just two days ago, he said, Rabbi, business is bad. Hashem put him in the wrong file. If one thing Hashem doesn't like is crooks, and somebody who cries, business is bad, business is bad, guarantee that he will bring on himself problems that the business will be bad. Guarantee. Someone who brings it and complain and lie all the time, I'm very poor, I'm not doing good, Rabbi, go to the rich people, why you come to me? Hashem says, no problem. The Gemara says, Kol amkayem Torah me'oni, sofo lekayma me'osher. כל המבטל תורה, מאושר סופו לבטלה מעוני. Someone who supports the Torah, even though he's poor, from poverty. Hashem say, I promise, he will not die before he will support the Torah out of wealth. Guarantee. Why? Measure for measure. You didn't have, but you gave for my Torah? Don't worry, the reward is waiting. Or the other way around. Someone who has plenty, 13 vacations a year, three houses, 15 cars in the driveway, the yeshiva is closing down tomorrow, they're begging him, help, one month help. No, no, you came in the wrong time. Of course, it's never the right time. Somebody like this, that never tell Torah from Osher, from, from wealth, it's just a matter of time until he will be forced out of poverty, measure for measure. So the Prophet asks, what's the problem? The Gemara say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tolerated murders, Gilui Arayot, all kinds of sex crimes that people did, which is the most despicable things in the eyes of Hashem, read in the Torah. Hard to believe. All these kinds of crimes in Gehenom, there are seven different levels. It starts from the lenient one to the very strict one. The lower it is, the worse the punishments are. All the sex crimes are in six and seven sections, the lowest one. Why? No tolerance for that. Same thing, Mechalel Shabbat and Oved Avodah Zarah. So, for people who worship idols, Hashem still did not destroy Bet HaMikdash. Think about it. There is Bet HaMikdash, clear miracles in front of the eyes of every person. Everyone is shocked. They come to Bet HaMikdash, they see the smoke of the Mizbeach, go straight like a pole, all the way up. It, the wind, it's windy. You cannot keep your head on your head. It's flying from the wind, but the smoke goes straight. Smoke. Little wind, the smoke goes all over. No. They slaughter animals thousands every month. Not one fly. Never. All kinds of miracles in Beta Mikdash. Seven candles, 
Six, the oil is for a few hours. One, the same amount of oil until tomorrow evening. Hanukkah miracle every day in Bet HaMikdash. Thousands of people go inside. You cannot move like a sardine. When they have to bow down, nobody touch each other. Miracles. A woman never had a miscarriage, even though she smelled all the great smell of the barbecuing the meat. Not once. And many examples the Gemara gives. People worship idols. Hashem is very upset. I have my temple here, and you're going to sacrifice animals to all kinds of statues of the Goim. There will be something that requests a destruction of the temple. Hashem had patience. Not yet. So, for murders, not yet. For Gilui Arayot, not yet. For Avodah Zarah, not yet. If you know a little bit Halakha, a person, Chas Shalom, if a guy puts a gun to his head and tell him, I want you to do one of these three sins, Shfichut Damim, Gilui Arayot, Avodah Zarah, he cannot agree. He has to say, Shema Israel and die. Any other sin he has to do. Why? The Torah says, I don't want you to die because of my mitzvot. Except those three. And those three people did here and there, and Hashem did not destroy the temple. What made us lose the first temple, which was greater than the second in his level? What made us lose it? People did not learn enough Torah. I want you to know. In this time, only eight, nine hundred years ago, in the generation of the Rambam, every Jew that had a business, farmers, tailors, shoemakers, butchers, all these people who used to work, they used to learn minimum nine hours a day, reading the Rambam. Rambam writes, three hours, three hours, and three hours a day. Only 850 years ago. Do you know what we're talking here about? Nothing. Nine hours a day minimum, every Jew. Today, some of our rabbis don't have time to learn nine hours a day. But at that time, every tailor, every shoemaker, he was learning nine hours a day. And he used to cost money to learn. Not like today begging people, come, Chinese food, pizza, Air condition. Next thing they're gonna ask somebody who come and give them massage while they're learning. <laughs> Abba, it's gonna be massage, I come. No, you know, you have to understand me. I work very hard in a business, I fall asleep. Probably some of you say, you know, Abba, you know why I don't go to learn? I come from the business, I close the store at seven. By the time I get home, it's eight. By the time I finish eating dinner, it's already nine. What do you expect me now to do? What? To come and fall asleep in the face of the rabbi? The answer is absolutely yes. And you know what? Some of you who will fall asleep in the lecture may get a greater reward than someone who is up. Why? Someone who is up until he enjoy coming. <laughs> you, what pleasure you have. It's like going, sitting in a subway and fall asleep. Well, what do you get from that? But since you come, that's a great thing in the eyes of Hashem. And by the way, the soul records everything you hear, for good and for bad. Person fall asleep, and the people learn Torah, wake him up, ask him, tell me, what did I just learn while you were snoring here? What do you expect me to know? I'm very tired, I didn't sleep all night. Look, I was sleeping here, I can't, I can't tell you what. Hypnotize him now, get it out of his subconscious, he'll tell you every word that everyone in the yeshiva said in the last two hours, 60 guys around all the tables, he will be able to repeat each table from the beginning to the end, every beep, even if the guy picked up the phone in the middle of the learning. How? The soul records everything. When a person comes to Shamaim, 200 days straight, he has to talk the Torah. And if not, you didn't even pass the first test. 200 days straight. What are you going to say? The Knicks against the Chicago tomorrow, Hashem? What are you going to tell Hashem? Business is tough. The market is up. 
the economy is bad, the size of the engine of the Ferrari was changed in 1989, what are you going to say? What is Torah? That's the question. But don't worry. It sounds hard, but it's not so hard. Because if you learn one hour a day, you're going to have 200 hours, very good ones. One hour a day. Ah, uh, you may say, whatever I learn a minute later, I don't remember. You expect me to remember it after 80 years? After 80 years? Over there, there's no forgetness. Whatever you ever heard, you remember forever. Forever. 100%. Torah says that the prophet Yirmiya asked and I just explained that they were learning a lot, a lot of Torah even more than today so the answer is the Torah wasn't important enough for them you understand what we're talking here about learning Torah but the Torah it's not important. How do I know? It's a pasuk in the Tanakh. Tofsei ha-Torah lo yedauni. Those who have full knowledge in the Torah don't know me. Don't know me yet. So who's going to know Hashem? Those who learn Torah all day don't know Him. We're going to know Him? Who's going to know Hashem? The bus driver that doesn't have time to learn? Those who are in Yeshiva didn't have. So the answer is... If it's important for you, you cannot live a second without it. David HaMelech said, Tov li Torah, ticha me alfei zahav v'chesef. If you read Tehillim, you see that David HaMelech all day was talking about him and Hashem. All day. That's what he was doing. Taking care of the sheep, sitting somewhere in a mountain, winter, summer, all day, speaking to Hashem, like a love story. Read Tehillim, you see. What do we learn from Torah Tehillim? You know, how do you know, how do you know if a person loves something? How do you know? Let's say if you bring to me somebody for one day to be by me. By the end of the day, I'm going to tell you what's his favorite things in life. How do, how do I know? Based on what comes out of his mouth. If I see he's impressed from the pictures, he looks at them, he's impressed, he goes and he checks another one and another one and he come closer, that means it's very important for him, art, pictures, he love it. If he talks about sports all day, that's what he has in life. If he speaks about the news all day, that's his life. If he speaks about gambling, that's his life. If he speaks about Torah all day, that's his life. What comes out of the person now shows who he is. Nothing else. There's no way to know. When a person loves something, he talks about it all the time. When people love food, all day they just talk about food. This restaurant, they open a new one. I know a boy that is extremely heavy. What does he do all day? From the minute he comes from school, what do you think he does? He checks the local newspaper which, <laughs> which restaurant opened, if there's something new in town. Check their menus, compare between one to another where they have specials. What's the only thing on his mind? Food. That's what he occupied his time with. So, here we go. This is what the Torah said. A wise person, be quiet. Don't praise yourself for your wisdom. Let's see. A gibor al italel begvurato, a hero, don't brag about your strength and that you're a hero. What's the third one? The wealthy, Hashem say. Ashir al italel beoshro, don't praise yourself about your wealth. Why? Because me, who is me, God, are not interested in those three. If your brain is very sharp, you're born like this. You deserve a credit? No. If, you, if you're born and you're lucky in business, whatever you buy, all of a sudden goes up. I know one Hasid, he got married. He didn't know anything about business. He doesn't even speak English. 
young guy learning in Kolel, he had a little money from his wedding. One crook saw that he's very naive, and he came and told him there is acres of lot you can get it for fifteen thousand dollars. Acres. Look, here in Monsi, one acre costs you hundreds of thousands. Over there, it's going to be the investment of your life. <laughs> now, this guy, he doesn't know anything about business, but he knew that one acre in Queens, Brooklyn, in Monsi, anywhere you go, it costs a lot of money, one acre. So, well, it sounds too good to believe. Okay, where well, he took him to the place, he see forest. Drive with a car 10 minutes over there, it's still not over. So, okay, let's buy it. So he bought it. After, after he bought it, somebody that heard about it told him, what, are you crazy? There's no sewer there. It will cost you a fortune to remove all the trees, the big rocks, to make it straight. By the time you finish preparing the, the property to build, it won't be even pay to build something over there because it's a very cheap area, it's far, it's an hour north. For months it's two and a half hours north from Manhattan. Who wants to buy properties over there? You can buy a straight property over there for the same price. So basically, you lost your money. The person say, Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Yishem Hashem Vorach. Who gave me the $15,000 gift? Hashem. I bought something, Hashem took it, Baruch Hashem. Two, three years later, one real estate guy calls him. Hello, Mr. X, yes. You the owner of the property over there? <laughs> he thinks it's a joke. What, somebody now fooling me? Say, so, yes, I'm the owner. He so, said, we want to come speak to you about purchasing it from you. Are you interested to sell it? Yes. When can we meet? Okay, they met. Now, he said, I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. If they got to me for such a lousy place, something is fishy here. This time I'm going to take an expert. So he took somebody there that knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and they came to negotiate, and they're offering him a lot of money for this property. Why? They have a camp, camping with caravans, with generators, Trucks are coming, people are sleeping there, camping in the mountains. And the area is too, clo too small. There's a lot of business. They want to buy a few more acres to expand the camp. And the only way they can expand to is to his property. Now all of a sudden it's gold mine. He got a few million dollars for it. As it is, like this. A few million dollars. Somebody like this can come and teach us business, can say, look, what a genius I am. I made 10,000% profit on every inch of my property. Right? No, mister, you are very foolish, and thanks to your stupidity, Hashem made you rich. Where does it say it in the Torah? King Solomon said, Lo lechem. What do you think, that you, the wiser you become, you're going to be wealthier? Nah. Many professors cannot pay the rent. They know a lot. They learn all their life. So Hashem say, the hero, don't be, don't brag. The wealthy, don't brag. Don't. Don't think that this is your talent. So who should brag? Ki'im bazot italel. Who is entitled to brag? to praise himself. Who? No, I want to ask your opinion. Who does Hashem allow to brag about his achievement? Not the rich, not the smart. No, as who? Who, who left? Listen, listen good. Ki'im bazot italel. Who is entitled to be praised? Askel Translation. Someone who is clever enough to know me. To know what? That I created the world? Even the animals know it. So, what? To know what? 
to know that I am God? Is it possible not to open the door every second over there? Is it possible to lock it? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> to know what? That I am God, the God of mercy, justice, charity. Those are the one who I'm interested in. Let's see. Kindness, gemilut chasadim, mishpat, judgment. And Tzedakah. Tzedakah, three things. From all the things that I just mentioned, shh. No? What's going to be with this door? Tell me, from the three things that I mentioned, kindness, gmilut chasadim, very good. Tzedaka, very good. Judgment. Why judgment? David HaMelech said to Hashem, Shh, don't punish me, because I'm judging myself every day. You know, every word in Tehillim, have to light our eyes to see the way God is looking at us every second. This is the greatest teacher in history. Who are we going to learn from? Someone that was glued to Hashem. Cement. David HaMelech was... Davuk ba'kadosh baruch hu. Ve'atem advekim ba'ashem elokechem chayim kulchem hayom. If you have doubt, read Tehillim, you understand. What does he say? Hashem, you don't need to punish me. Why? I judge myself every day. That's what the Torah says. Im yesh mishpat lemata, en mishpat lemala. If a Jew judges himself every day, maybe he gives himself ridiculous punishment compared to what he really deserves to get. But just the fact that he has a system that every day, in the end of the day, he compares what he did good and bad and penalizes himself sometimes when it's necessary, that shows that this person is searching for the truth. And Hashem say, he already got punished for that. Same thing in a base din here. If a person get punished here in a base din, if he wouldn't get punished by them, by Hashem, it would be a million times worse. But since the judges here gave him X amount of penalty, the judgment over there dismissed. Yes. But uh, if uh, the system goes by judgment, midaka negit midaka. Right. So how come it... It's a million times worse there than here. It should be the same if it's midak and negid midah. No, punishments in this world is midak and negid midah, too. But once a person finishes his life, that's it. There's no more educational punishment. You understand? Gehenom, it's not midak and negid midah, right? A person that uh, did X amount of sins, if you read his punishment in Gehenom, it's not really midak and negid midah. Over here, if a person laughs at his friend that his tooth broke, and a year later, somebody laughs at him in a different scenario that he stood broke, then you see it's midah keneged midah. He stole a hundred, a week later he lost two hundred, he doesn't see the connection. That's midah keneged midah. He wasn't a good son to his parents, and now his children giving him hell, that's midah keneged midah here. You understand? Once he's going there, there's a whole system of judgments over there. You know, there used to be two great rabbis. You see their name in a book. One, his name was Debach, Bait Chadash. And one was his son-in-law, his Chatan, married to his daughter. His name was the Taz. Bach, it's Bait Chadash. Taz, it's to raise the Av. Abbreviation. They were the biggest Chachamim in Ashkenaz, in Europe. The biggest. The, when the Bach chose the Taz to be his Chatan, they made a deal. I want you to marry my daughter, and I promise you for five years, every day, one meal with meat. At least once a day, I guarantee you one plate with meat. Why? Meat 
makes the person stronger. And if he eats meat, you can learn Torah better. That's the logic here. One of the ways to judge yourself, if you, hear, if you go to a lecture and you hear the cell phone goes once, right away you have to put yourself on. And if not, it's a sin. Because it's bitul Torah of everybody. You should know it for the next time you go to a lecture. Even things like this, Hashem is very upset at people. Why? It shows that the lecture and the Torah is not important to you. If you would sit in front of lousy Obama, you wouldn't dare that your phone will, be, will ring. If it would happen to somebody in a crowd, you'll kill yourself. Right away you smash your phone. God forbid he won't beep when Obama is speaking. So Obama is more important than Hashem, than the Torah. That's, what it, that's, that's the conclusion. Otherwise, there's no other way. If you sit in front of Gaddafi, you will dare that your phone will ring? Gaddafi, or Mubarak, or Bin Laden, doesn't matter. You wouldn't let your phone ring. <laughs> Only in Torah lecture, the phone rings non-stop. Or in a synagogue, in the middle of... I even, had, I even had the merit to see in the middle of Shabbat, in Mincha, Somebody gets aliyah to the Torah, and in the middle of the learning, the learning, he's standing over there to say bracha, his cell phone begins to ring. <laughs> That's what happens when the rabbis never open a book and never learn the halacha. And they give aliyah to somebody like this that come with a cell phone. He wasn't a doctor. <laughs> doctors allowed. Even doctors have to put their phone on vibrate to prevent Chilul Hashem. So let's go back. So the Bach made a deal with his Chatan. After a few years, business was bad, for real. By then, business was really bad, not like, ah, business is bad. Five years already, he's complaining. <laughs> so one time, he gave his son a plate with splint. Splint in Hebrew, it's called Tchol. Tchol, it's empty meat. It's very light. It's not really meat. Meat. It's very bad. The garbage of the garbage. They give it to the dogs to eat, the butchers. What can you do? He couldn't afford. Guess what? His son-in-law got... He saw what happened. He sent him an invitation to court for violating the contract to his father-in-law, the chief rabbi of Ashkenaz, a legendary rabbi in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Turi, open over, their names appear over there. Send him an invitation to Besdin. The whole town cannot believe such a thing. Son-in-law take the chief rabbi to court for giving him splint instead of meat? Who heard such a thing? They go to court, one serious, whole serious trial. Witnesses, he has to explain, they write. In the end, the judges made a verdict that splint, it's also meat. It was never said in a contract what kind of meat. Even the leathers, the leather of the, of the chicken it can, it can be considered meat. He didn't say what kind of meat. Meat, finished. Once the trial finished, they came out. All the ignorance was standing outside, you know, the photographers. They want to create a headline. So they say, hey, Rabbi, don't you ashamed to take your father-in-law to court? Why did you do such a thing? We know you're a righteous guy. He said, don't you understand? If I wouldn't, every day I learn half an hour less Torah because I don't get the meat that I used to get. Close to the end of the day, I'm dizzy already. Why? I feel the difference between splint and meat. Half an hour less Torah. The Not that I don't learn. I learn, but in less quality. Do you know what a judgment is subject to when it comes to Hashem? Because I love my father-in-law very much. I know what the rabbis will decide here. When the court decide here, the judgment over there is dismissed. But if I wouldn't take him here, he come in front of Hashem and Hashem say to him, because of you, your son-in-law learned less half an hour to write every day, multiplied by who knows how many years. And Hashem is very strict on his Torah. As I showed you before, Beta Migdash was destroyed for learning less Torah. 
Not learning at all, learning a little bit less. And Hashem didn't tolerate this. So, the Torah says like this, Mishpate Hashem emet tzadeku yachdav. The justice of Hashem is true, and they are right when they are together. Let me explain this a little bit better. The door stopped, the microphone stopped. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> I have three enemies in my lecture. One is the doors. Even when the door don't make noise, because every time somebody come by the door, a hundred faces go to the door. The whole, you don't see it, because you think you're the only one, but I see all the faces, like this. Somebody come in, the whole lecture. Go and concentrate when you see the faces of the people like a wind, windshield wipers. <laughs> windshield wipers. Speaking about windshield wipers, I have a good joke for you. But first I'll tell you the three enemies. One was the door, one is the microphone that always somehow start to whistle, and the third is the little kids that they be, as soon as the lecture starts, they begin to make problems. An hour before the lecture, silent. As soon as the lecture starts, the Satan come and play with them and they begin to cry. They don't even know why. Why? Because this is the way it works. When the Satan sees Jews learning Torah, he goes crazy. Hashem programmed him. Every time he see people do what Hashem told them, he suffers. 100%. It's, an, it's like an Arab see a Jew on the street. Can you ask him not to hate him? Is it possible? Is it possible to tell the tiger, please don't attack the zebra until we finish take pictures? <laughs> Wait two more minutes. We didn't finish. The catalog is not finished. <laughs> It's program. There's nothing you can do about it. So, one guy had a scooter. He was riding a scooter, the engine died. But he was lucky, he saw a big garage over there with semi-trailers, trucks. At least there's mechanic over there. At the garage, okay. So, so they call up the guy, the, the, the mechanic, and he said, look, my engine died. We'll be able to fix it? He said, you know, we're not usually fixing scooters, but I see you have nothing else to go, nowhere else to go, so leave it here, come back in two hours. He comes back after two hours, he said, here, $500, you're ready to go. <laughs> Pays him the money, he goes, he takes the scooter down the stairs, he puts it down, he starts it, and he begins to drive. So the scooter goes six feet forward, six feet reverse. Six feet forward, six feet reverse. He goes back and forth. He goes back to Mister. What is this? <laughs> so I tell you the truth. It would take two weeks to order an engine for this scooter. So I had an engine of a windshield wiper of a truck. <laughs> I put it instead. So the car, the truck goes, the, the scooter goes back and forth. You know, it's the windshield. They put the engine inside. There's the faces of the people like this. All right, let's go back. What's Mishpatei Hashem Emet Sadeku Yachdav? I want to ask you a question. Shh. If you knew, Chas Shalom, that somebody that is very important to you have to have a surgery, a very complicated surgery, and there's two options. In one hospital, you have 100 doctors that are almost perfect in this field. Almost perfect, 90% their knowledge about this brain surgery. But there is one hospital, there's only one doctor over there, is 100% specialist. Who would you rather operate on your relative? Then 100 doctors, each one of them is big shot, 90% knowledge, all of them together, or the one individual that has 100% knowledge? One. How come? One against 100? Come on. Add 90, 90, 90 times 100, it's a lot compared to 100. It's a lot. No. If you have 1% of the knowledge missing, the 99% is worthless. 
You understand? Why? In the brain, you have 10 trillion connections. 10 trillion connections. If you only know 9.999 million, billion, trillion connection, whatever, 9.999. It's one, less than 1% of the connections, you're not aware what they are. Can you operate? One little wire you cut in a brain, the wires, you know, take a hair out of your head, pull, pull a hair. Look at that in the sun, can you see it? In the sun, look at, look at the air, try to see it. If it's blonde, for sure you don't see it, even in a dark day. If it's black, only when you're very close you can see the air. If you, if you put it here, that's it, it's very thin. Did you know that this air is thicker, thicker than 100 wires from your brain combined? This is how thin are the wires inside the brain, which is 80% gel, liquid, size of an apple. One of them, you take a very sharp knife, one of them you cut. The person falls like this, and nothing helps. What about all the others? Nothing you can do. That's it. To be a chacham, when the puzzle has all the pieces, then you see the picture. If you only have 70%, you see stains, little green, little brown, little black. It's very hard to see a picture. You can imagine. But you have missing knowledge. Sometimes people come to the rabbis, and the rabbi answer the question, and they think they know better. It doesn't make sense what he told me. I'll never believe, I'll never understand. What is this? This is a rabbi, what is he saying? All week he's complaining. Why? <laughs> he doesn't even know 1% in order for him to answer this question. But he already calculated that the rabbi was wrong and it doesn't make sense. This is us. This is us. Each one of us. Can anybody here raise his hand and say that he doesn't have one day in his life that he complained why he deserved this and this and this? One day. That everything that happened to him, he said, I am 100% guilty and I deserve it. He missed the train, it's my fault. Chas v'shalom, a tragedy, it's my fault. I deserve it, I deserve it, I deserve it. Usually today it's all the opposite. Why? I became religious. Since I became religious, everything goes wrong. I used to be a millionaire. Look at this. No customers anymore. He opened across the street. Right? I hear it all the time. I know one guy in uh, Canada, from the moment he started to keep some mitzvot, some, few, all, all of a sudden he's going bankrupt, the bank takes away his building, problems, he cannot sleep at night, his wife gave him problems, from all over. Go and explain a guy that is two months religious that it's the best thing that can happen to him. Go and explain it to him. If a person became religious, and his life is very smooth, guarantee that his tshuva was not accepted, guarantee. If you became religious a few years ago, a few months ago, and since then you did not have any rocking and shaking, now you have to worry. The chachamim, the from from birth, the big rabbis, when they saw 40 days without suffering, 40 days, no problems, cannot be. It's a big problem, big concern. Guess what they used to do? Volunteer work. Went on the street to pick up rocks, to clean the roads from rocks that the horses can pass by. What are you doing, Rabbi? At 39 days, I did not have any problem. I didn't lose money, nobody beat me up, my wife is too nice to me, everything is fine. I don't want to get my reward in this life. It means Hashem is making it too easy for me. Rambam in Ilchot Shuvah, if you want to become religious for real, first thing a person has to do is to learn the laws of repentance by Rambam. Chelek Aleph, the six books, Rambam, Mishneh Torah, in the middle over there, have to learn it 100 times until he knows it by heart. Why? This is the most important thing. What? You want to you wanna be a doctor. Can you be a doctor without going to medical school? Can you be a lawyer without learning in uh, NYU law or Harvard law? Can you be a lawyer? You don't know the laws. Who's going to teach you? 
Can you be a mechanic without working in a garage one day of your life? Can you become a Baal Tshuva without learning the laws of Tshuva? In your dream. Who can raise his hand here and tell me that he knows the love of repentance by heart? And I'm sure all of you want to be close to Hashem and be clean in a judgment and come after Yom Kippur, crystal pure, I'm sure. No doubt about this part. Who learned these laws of repentance at least once? For good. How do you make repentance for sins? How do you make repentance for mitzvot that you never did and now you started? What about the past? How do you make repentance about sins that you make other Jews commit? Machtia Rabim. How do you make repentance for sins that the punishment in the Torah is karet for the soul? Cutting for the soul. How do you bring the soul back to where it was supposed to be? How do you make repentance for Hilul Hashem? They saw you as a Jew, they put your picture on a newspaper. Or on the street. Or the guy started to scream at you in the street and everybody walked by and saw what you did. Or the candy camera saw you stealing quarters from the meter. Or breaking the meter when you want to save a dollar. That's, called, that's a big thing, Hilul Hashem. Or you drive like crazy with your kippah. Rabbi, it's Shabbat in five hours. In a rush. Shh, shh, cutting the goyim. If you're righteous, then Hashem helps you a lot. When a person is born, he's intelligent. Every one of us has intelligence, right? Some of us are more smart, some of us are less. When somebody says something, there are people in one second has the answer. Usually it's always like that. And there are people even an hour, they never get the answer. Where does the knowledge come from? Who can tell me? Why this guy, after a second, he knows the answer? And the other one, an hour, he's sitting and killing himself and he doesn't get the answer. Why? You can see that the other guy, he knows a lot about medicine. He knows about computer, he knows economy, he knows a lot of things. When it comes to Torah, this guy answer one, two, three, and this guy takes him forever. Why? How? Where does it come from? What's the root of this difference? The answer is, it's called Si'ata Dishmaya. Help from Hashem. Everything a person does in his life, Hashem helps him. But the most important thing in life is Torah, Judaism, Torah, mitzvot. Over here, it's the most important things that we get help from Hashem. We must get help from Hashem. If we don't help, help, help from Hashem, there is no way to make tshuva. No way. I'll give you an example. The Torah says, Aomer, echta ve'ashuv, echta ve'ashuv, en maspikim be'yado. Someone will say, okay, Rabbi, I know the truth today, but I'm young. Let me celebrate for another 10, 20 years. When I be 50, 60, I'll consider to become tzaddik. But right now it's premature. I'm not ready for it yet. Okay, so now he's 50, and he keeps his promise. He wants to be tzaddik. But Hashem doesn't help him. It's very difficult. He goes to learn, he cannot understand anything. He asks somebody to teach him, he's busy. Everything he's trying to do, it's hard. He wants to buy tefillin, a crew came and charged him $3,000 for it. He goes to buy sukkah, another crook, $5,000. Everything he does, he has bad experience. He gives up. Who made it difficult for him? The one who is anxious to see his children making tshuva, Hashem. For this individual, Hashem ruined it for him. Why? Because this is what it means, the God of justice. Ani ela emet ve'atzedek. You play games with me? I must be tough with you. Why? Why I must be tough with you? Okay, no, let me close my eyes. Pretend I didn't see that you play games with me for 20 years. What's the problem? After all, you're coming to become religious. Better late than never, Rabbi. Better late than never. If I will behave to you like this, 
those who became religious 20 years before, they also came to the same lecture with you. They did become, and you didn't, they will say, where is the justice? We did it right away, and he played games for another 20 years, and we're all going to have the same end? Where is the justice? That means the Torah is not fair. Hashem, you promise you the God of the justice, of fairness. You're not fair, I'm sorry. That means chas v'shalom, at that particular moment when God forbid Hashem will help the wicked as he helped the righteous, same way, that will be the first line in the Torah. Why? You cannot rely on it. Hashem say one thing and he does the opposite. Do you understand why there's no choice? But Hashem, I'm the son of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. But I did make tshuva. You should have done it 20 years earlier. Not that for sure Hashem will not accept this tshuva. Because if you really, really push hard, everything will be accepted in the end. But it's going to sweat so much more than the other guy. Every day of our life, we have opportunities. You don't take it today, tomorrow it's going to be a lot harder, guarantee. And the next day even harder and harder. Why? You had a chance many years before. If you would do, do it then, I would help you a lot more. And you see the young guys, see, pay attention to this life that we live in, how it works like computer, it's very precise. Those teenage, 18, 19, 20, 22, when they become religious, they have much bigger achievement than the older people who become religious. Someone age 60 become religious, if he learn five minutes to write a day, ooh, ah. Or he read a little bit Tehillim, ooh, what a tzaddik. This 18, 19, he goes to yeshiva 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, a year later he's a rabbi already. Why? Because that guy has a lot more help from Hashem. The other one, where were you 40 years? You're blind? 40 years I sent you messengers, messengers, hints, wake up. 40 years you play games. Okay, so I appreciate that it's better late than never, but you have to sweat now, my friend. And the achievements are much, much less. Somebody says, the Torah promised that if you make tshuva a minute before you die, Hashem accepts it. True. It changed you right away, dramatically, it changed the trial. There's only one problem. You have no credits, no rewards. Maybe you erased a lot of the punishments, true. Maybe Hashem will reincarnate you in a new body with a much better chance now for your next life to become tzaddik. Yes. But right now, you are empty. You did not earn anything. Yes, you owed millions of dollars, and they're willing to erase it but you still don't have a penny in your pocket. The other one is very rich. Because he was keeping 20 years before you. You know, 20 years of mitzvot, how much it is? One guy, lo alenu, had cancer. And his surgeon is a Jew, atheist Jew. Can you believe a brain surgeon that is an atheist? I don't believe. I know it's a lie. They say they are. Why they say they are? Because if they say they believe, what the rabbi is going to tell them? So how can you live in a lie? So to prevent that question, they say we don't believe. So this supposedly atheist, he tells the guy, we have to make a chemo, you know? But we want to give you the two options. If we don't give you any treatment, you died in six months, but you don't suffer. Slowly, slowly, in the last few days, you'll be weak until you die. If we treat you with chemo, you can live up to two years, but your life is hell. You lose your hair, your beard, you suffer, you're weak all the time. It's really not pleasant. So the, the guy said, I have to ask my rabbi. What do I know? I'm an ordinary Jew. Let me go to the rabbi. Who was his rabbi? The lucky guy. One of the greatest tzaddikim we ever had in America, of Moshe Feinstein. Zecher Tzadik Livracha. The holy man, big chacham, humbled, a giant. He comes to him and he says, Rabbi, which one of the two I should choose? Six months normal life? Two years hell. He said, two years. 
So you ask him why? So you know what it is another year and a half of mitzvot every day? Do you know what an achievement it does for you for the reward in Olam Abba? Every day tzitzit for another 24 hours, tefillin every day, go up to the Torah, you make brachot, you learn Torah, you give tzedakah, you say shma, you pray three times a day. It's millions of mitzvot, millions, every month, multiply by a year and a half. Where is the question starts, Bichlal? Every second you can live, you should do everything to live another minute. Why? Just you thought about Hashem for the next minute, an extra thought for a second or two, that was already worth it. So he went back to the professor and he said, Kimo. And the professor said, why are you a rabbi asked this? I made up that decision. It's curious. So he answered him just what I said. It's much more mitzvot. You, you, you earn a lot more. That's why every second of life, it's very valuable. Guess what? This atheist got it into his head. And he wanted to meet the Rav. And you know, after that, there was a shortcut to become a tzaddik. And he became Baal Shuvah. So now l listen to this. This guy, nobody wants to get cancer, obviously. He got cancer. Okay, now he got it already. It was worth it for him, the two years of chemo and the suffering, and to die younger, who knows, 10 or 20 years than an average person, just to make that professor religious. Because the Zohar says, if a person would make one Jew religious in his 70 years of suffering, it was worth it for him. If people would know what to make one Jew return back to Hashem, they would run after it their entire life. Like crazy. If you're rich, you would take a guy and say, listen, become religious, I'll pay, let, I don't know, I'll pay you $20,000 a month salary. Don't do anything. Just come, learn Torah. I'll sponsor you. I'll buy you a car. I'll send you to Israel twice a year. Just agree to become religious. It was voted for you. One, ten, hundred, thousand, twenty thousand. It's a matter. It's a matter of efforts and money. It was voted for him. For sure, one minute of life. If a person murdered a person that is eighteen years old. According to the Torah, he has to be executed for the murder. Measure for measure, they're killing him. What happens if he killed an old person that is 120 years old? Tomorrow it's his birthday. It's going to be 120. How long is he going to die? He's going to live another day, two days, three days. They break the record of Moshe Rabbeinu and Rabbi Akiva. No. What's the problem? Anyway, a life of a 120 years old person is not exactly ideal. He can see, he cannot hear, he cannot walk. Some of them connected to the machine already, they sleep in bed. What is the point now? Oh, okay, no, so I choked him with a pillow. What happened? <laughs> what happened? I did him a favor, he thinks. According to the Jewish court, they kill him exactly like they killed the one who killed 18 years old. Where is the justice? It's not fair. The Torah is fair. He took a hundred years from the person's life. He's 18 only. You give him the same punishment of somebody who took one day of life or one hour of life, the same punishment? So I have news for you. If there was a way to know that this person is going to die in 30 seconds from now, and you choked him after 25 seconds, what did you take? Another breath. Oh, it's over. So one second before you killed him. You are 100% murderer in Shamaim, like you killed an infant. Why? We have to understand what's going on here. Every, you stole 100, you pay 200. You stole 1,000, you pay 2,000. There's a formula here. It has to be logical. The answer is, because one moment from a life of a Jew, there is no price to pay for it. It's endless. If a Jew just scream in that five seconds, Shema Israel, Hashem, I love you, finished, and he died. 
and you took it away from him, those five seconds. The five seconds, he could have earned so much, more than all the money a person can ever earn in this earth. Those five seconds. Since you took it away from him, you deserve chas v'shalom execution. Everything extra, no, Hashem knows how to calculate it over there. But here, it's enough. You take one moment from him for you to deserve, God forbid, execution. Why? This is the value of a life of a Jew. And people don't know that according to the Torah, if a guy puts a gun to your head and says, I want you to take a bite from this shrimp or from this cheeseburger, one bite. You fasted today, it was a fast, you're hungry, I'm doing you a favor, take a bite. Pepperoni pizza, not the fake, the real. How can the Jews live without have pepperoni pizza? Rabbi, wow, we're gonna be less than the Goyim. Every, all of a sudden you come, you see pizza, pepperoni, no, no, don't worry, it's, ve it's ve vegetarian. <laughs> Everything has an imitation today. Sushi, they put what scrubs, right? fake one. Everything fake. But we won't feel that we lose something that the goyim has. No, if he puts a gun to your head and say, take a bite from this pork, one bite. If not, I kill you. What do you have to do? You have to eat, right? Not true. Not true. You have to offer him bribe. Hey, Vinny, before you kill me, I have something you may like. You take your watch. Here. Take it, leave me alone. Two hundred dollars. Take it. Come on, you're kidding me? For this, you want me to leave you? Nah. It's a clever guy. He knows. Okay, you take your wallet. Look, it's a leather wallet. It's five hundred dollars inside. Take it. No, 